The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett To Mr. Henry Davis, bookseller, in London. Abergavenny, August 4th. Respected Sir, I have received your esteemed favour of the 13th Ultimo, whereby it appeareth, that you have perused those same letters, the which were delivered unto you by my friend, the Reverend Mr. Hugo Bin, and I am pleased to find you think they may be printed with a good prospect of success, inasmuch as the objections you, mention, I humbly conceive, are such as may be redargued, if not entirely removed, and, first, in the first place, as touching what prosecutions may arise from printing the private correspondence of persons still living, give me leave, with all due submission, to observe, that the letters in question were not written and sent under the seal of secrecy, that they have no tendency to the malafama, or prejudice of any person whatsoever, but rather to the information and edification of mankind, so that it becometh a sort of duty to promulgate them in use publicum. Besides, I have consulted Mr. Davy Higgins, an eminent attorney of this place, who, after due inspection and consideration, declareth, that he doth not think the said letters contain any matter which will be held actionable in the eye of the law. Finally, if you and I should come to a right understanding, I do declare in verbo sacerdotis, that, in case of any such prosecution, I will take the whole upon my own shoulders, even quod fine and imprisonment. Though, I must confess, I should not care to undergo flagellation, tam ad turpitutinum, quam ad amera tutinum po eno spectans. Secondly, concerning the personal resentment of, Mr. Justice Liz Mahago, I may say, non floxi fascio, I would not willingly vilipend any Christian, if, peradventure, he deserveth that epithet, albeit, I am much surprised that more care is not taken to exclude from the commission all such vagrant foreigners as may be justly suspected of disaffection to our happy constitution, in church and state, God forbid that I should be so uncharitable, as to, affirm, positively, that the said Lismahago is no better than a Jesuit in disguise, but this I will assert and maintain, totus viribus, that, from the day he qualified, he has never been once seen intra templi pariats, that is to say, within the parish church. Thirdly, with respect to what passed at Mr. Kendall's table, when the said Lismahago was so brutal in his reprehensions, I must inform you, my good sir, that I was obliged to retire, not by fear arising from his minatory reproaches, which, as I said above, I value not of the rush, but from the sudden effect produced, by a barbel's row which I had eaten at dinner, not knowing, that the said row is at certain seasons violently cathartic, as Galen observeth in his chapter Periectos. Fourthly, and lastly, with reference to the manner in, which I got possession of these letters, it is a circumstance that concerns my own conscience only, sufficeth it to say, I have fully satisfied the parties in whose custody they were, and, by this time, I hope I have also satisfied you in such ways, that the last hand may be put to our agreement, and the work proceed with all convenient expedition, in which I hope I rest, respected sir, your very, humble servant, Jonathan Dustwich. P.S. I propose, Dio Volenti, to have the pleasure of seeing you in the great city, towards all hillow tide, when I shall be glad to treat with you concerning a parcel of Miss Sermons of a certain clergyman deceased, a cake of the right leaven, for the present taste of the public. Verbum sapienti, and C. J. To the Reverend Mr. Jonathan Dustwich, at, Sir, I received yours in course of post, and shall be glad to treat with you for the MS which I have delivered to your friend Mr. Ben, but can by no means comply with the terms proposed. Those things are so uncertain, writing is all a lottery, I have been a loser by the works of the greatest men of the age, I could mention particulars, and name names, but, don't choose it, the taste of the town is so changeable. Then there have been so many letters upon travels lately published, what between Smollett's, Sharp's, Derrick's, Thicknesses, Baltimore's, and Baratty's, together with Shandy's sentimental travels 
the public seems to be cloyed with that kind of entertainment, nevertheless, I will, if you please, run the risque of printing and publishing, and, you shall have half the profits of the impression, you need not take the trouble to bring up your sermons on my account, nobody reads sermons but Methodists and dissenters, besides, for my own part, I am quite a stranger to that sort of reading, and the two persons, whose judgment I depended upon in those matters, are out of the way, one is gone abroad, carpenter of a man of war, and the other, has, been silly enough to abscond, in order to avoid a prosecution for blasphemy, I'm a great loser by his going off, he has left a manual of devotion half finished on my hands, after having received money for the whole copy, he was the soundest divine, and had the most orthodox pen of all my people, and I never knew his judgment fail, but in flying from his bread and butter on this occasion. By owning, you was not put in bodily fear by Lismahago, you preclude yourself from the benefit of a good plea, over and above the advantage of binding him over. In the late war, I inserted in my evening paper, a paragraph that came by the post, reflecting upon the behavior of a certain regiment in battle. An officer of said regiment came to my shop, and, in the presence of my wife and journeyman, threatened, to cut off my ears, as I exhibited marks of bodily fear more ways than one, to the conviction of the bystanders, I bound him over, my action lay, and I recovered. As for flagellation, you have nothing to fear, and nothing to hope, on that head, there has been but one printer flogged at the cart's tail these thirty years, that was Charles Watson, and he assured me it was no more than a flea bite. C. S. has been threatened several times by the House of L., but it came to nothing. If an information should be moved for, and granted against you, as the editor of those letters, I hope you will have honesty and wit enough to appear and take your trial, if you should be sentenced to the pillory, your fortune is made, as times go, that's a sure step to honor and preferment. I shall think myself happy, if I can lend you a lift, and am, very sincerely, yours, Henry Davis. London, August 10th. Please my kind service to your neighbor, my cousin Maddock, I have sent an almanac and court calendar, directed for him at Mr. Sutton's, bookseller, in Gloucester, carriage paid, which he will please to accept as a small token of my regard. My wife, who is very fond of toasted cheese, presents her compliments to, him, and begs to know if there's any of that kind, which he was so good as to send us last Christmas, to be sold in London. H. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. To Dr. Lewis. Doctor, the pills are good for nothing, I might as well swallow snowballs to cool my reins. I have told you over and over how hard I am to move, and at this time of day, I ought to know something of my own constitution. Why will you be so positive? Prithee send me another prescription, I am as lame and as much tortured in all my limbs as if I was broke, upon the wheel, indeed, I am equally distressed in mind and body, as if I had not plagues enough of my own, those children of my sister are left me for a perpetual source of vexation. What business have people to get children to plague their neighbors? A ridiculous incident that happened yesterday to my niece Liddy, has disordered me in such a manner, that I expect to be laid up with another fit of, the gout, perhaps, I may explain myself in my next. I shall set out tomorrow morning for the hot well at Bristol, where I am afraid I shall stay longer than I could wish. On the receipt of this send Williams thither with my saddle horse and the demi beak. Tell Barnes to thresh out the two old ricks, and send the corn to market, and sell it off to the poor at a shilling a bushel under market price. I have received a snivelling letter from Griffin, offering to make a public submission and pay costs. I want none of his submissions, neither will I pocket any of his money. The fellow is a bad neighbour, and I desire to have nothing to do with him, but as he is purse proud, he shall pay for his insolence. Let him give five pounds to the poor of the parish, and I will withdraw my action, and in the meantime you may tell Prig to stop proceedings. Let Morgan's widow have the Alderney cow, and forty shillings to clothe her children, 
but don't say a syllable of the matter to any living soul, I'll make her pay when she is able. I desire you will lock up all my drawers, and keep the keys till meeting, and be sure you take the iron chest with my papers into your own custody, forgive all, this, trouble from, dear Lewis, your affectionate M. Bramble Gloucester, April 2nd. To Mrs. Gwilym, housekeeper at Brambleton Hall. Mrs. Gwilym, when this comes to hand, be sure to pack up in the trunk mail that stands in my closet, to be sent me in the Bristol wagon without loss of time, the following articles, viz. My rose-collared negligee with green robins, my yellow damask, and my black velvets with a short hoop, my blue quilted petticoat, my green mantle, my lace apron, my French commode, Macklin head and lappets and the light L box with my jowls. Williams may bring over my bum daffy, and the vial with the easings of Dr. Hill's dock water and chowder's laxative. The poor creature has been terribly stoprated ever since we left Huam. Pray take particular care of the house while the family is absent. Let there be a fire constantly kept in my brother's chamber and mine. The maids, having nothing to do, may be sat a spinning. I desire you'll clap a padlock on the wind cellar, and let none of the men have access to the strong bear, don't forget to have the gate shit every evening be dark, the gardener and the hind may lie below in the landry, to partake the house, with the blunderbuss and the great dog, and hope you'll have a watchful eye over the maids. I know, that hussy Mary Jones, loves to be rumping with the men. Let me know Alderney's calf beastled yet, and what he fought. If don't goose be sitting, and if the cobbler has cut Dicky, and how poor an email bore the operation. No more at present, but rests, yours, Tabitha Bramble Gloucester, April 2nd. To Mrs. Mary Jones, at Brambleton Hall. Dear Molly, heaving this opportunity, I send, my love to you and, so all, being in good health, and hoping to hear the same from you and that you and Saul will take my poor kitten to bed with you this cold weather. We have been all in, a sad taking here at Gloucester, Miss Liddy had liked to have run away with a player man, and young master and he would add own themselves a mischief, but the squire applied to the mayor, and they were, bound over. Mistress bid me not, speak a word of the matter to any Christian soul, no more I shall, for, we servants should see all and say nothing. But what was worse than all this, Chowder has had the misfortune to be worried by a butcher's dog, and came home in a terrible pickle, mistress was taken with the asterisks, but they soon went off. The doctor was sent for to Chowder, and he subscribed a repository which did him great service, thank God he's now in a fair way to do well, pray take care of my box and the pillibur and put them under your own bed, for, I do suppose madam. Gwai Lim will be a prying into my secrets, now my back is turned. John Thomas is in good health, but sulky. The squire gave away an old coat to a poor man, and John says as, how tis robbing him of his perquisites. I told him, by his agreement he, was to receive no veils, but he says as how there's a difference betwixt veils and perquisites, and so there is for certain. We are all going to the hot well where I shall drink your health in a glass of water, being, dear Molly, your humble servant to command, W. Jenkins Gloucester, April 6. To Sir Watkin Phillips, Bart. Of Jesus College, Oxon. Dear Phillips, as I have nothing more at heart than to convince you I am incapable of forgetting, or neglecting the friendship I made at college, now begin that correspondence by letters, which you and I agreed, at parting, to cultivate. I begin it sooner than I intended, that you may have it in your power to refute any idle reports which may, be circulated to my prejudice at Oxford, touching a foolish quarrel, in which I have been involved on account of my sister, who had been some time settled here in a boarding school. When I came hither with my uncle and aunt, who are our guardians, to fetch her away, I found her a fine tall girl, of seventeen, with an agreeable person, but remarkably simple, and quite ignorant of the world. This, disposition, and want of experience, 
had exposed her to the addresses of a person, I know not what to call him, who had seen her at a play, and, with a confidence and dexterity peculiar to himself, found means to be recommended to her acquaintance. It was by the greatest accident I intercepted one of his letters, as it was my duty to stifle this correspondence in its birth, I made it my business to find him out, and tell him very freely my sentiments of the matter. The spark did not like the style I used, and behaved with abundance of metal. Though his rank in life, which, by the by, I am ashamed to declare, did not entitle him to much deference, yet as his behavior was remarkably spirited, I admitted him to the privilege of a gentleman, and something might have happened, had not we been, prevented. In short, the business took care, I know not how, and made abundance of noise, recourse was had to justice, I was obliged to give my word and honor, and see. And tomorrow morning we set out for Bristol Wells, where I expect to hear from you by the return of the post. I have got into a family of originals, whom I may one day attempt to describe for your amusement. My aunt, Mrs. Tabitha Bromble, is a maiden of forty-five, exceedingly starched, vain, and ridiculous. My uncle is an odd kind of humorist, always on the fret, and so unpleasant in his manner, that rather than be obliged to keep him company, I'd resign all claim to the inheritance of his estate. Indeed his being tortured by the gout may have soured his temper, and, perhaps, I may like him better on further acquaintance, certain, it is, all his servants and neighbors in the country are fond of him, even to a degree of enthusiasm, the reason of which I cannot as yet comprehend. Remember me to Griffey Price, Gwen, Mansell, Bassett, and all the rest of my old Cambrian companions. Salute the bedmaker in my name, give my service to the cook, and pray take care of poor Ponto, for the sake of his old master who is, and ever will, be, dear Phillips, your affectionate friend, and humble servant, Jer. Melford Gloucester, April To Mrs. German at her house in Gloucester. Dear Madam, having no mother of my own, I hope you will give me leave to disburden my poor heart to you, who have always acted the part of a kind parent to me, ever since I was put under your care. Indeed, and indeed, my worthy governess may believe me, when I assure her, that I never harbored a thought that was otherwise than virtuous, and, if God will, give me grace, I shall never behave so as to cast a reflection on the care you have taken in my education. I confess I have given just cause of offense by my want of prudence and experience. I ought not to have listened to what the young man said, and it was my duty to have told you all that passed but I was ashamed to mention it, and then he behaved so modest and respectful, and seemed to be so, melancholy and timorous, that I could not find in my heart to do anything that should make him miserable and desperate. As for familiarities, I do declare, I never once allowed him the favor of a, salute, and as to the few letters that passed between us, they are all in my uncle's hands and I hope they contain nothing contrary to innocence and honor. I am still persuaded that he is not what he appears to be, but time will discover, meanwhile I will endeavor to forget a connection, which is so displeasing to my family. I have cried without ceasing, and have not tasted anything but tea, since I was hurried away from you, nor did I once close my eyes for three nights running. My aunt continues to chide me severely when we are by ourselves but I hope to soften her in time, by humility and, submission. My uncle, who was so dreadfully passionate in the beginning, has been moved by my tears and distress, and is now all tenderness and compassion, and my brother is reconciled to me on my promise to break off all correspondence with that unfortunate youth, but, notwithstanding all their indulgence, I shall have no peace of mind till I know my dear and ever honored governess has forgiven, her poor, disconsolate, forlorn, affectionate humble servant, till death, Lydia Melford Clifton, April 6. To Miss Letitia Willis, at Gloucester. My dearest Letty, I am in such a fright, lest this should not come safe to hand by the conveyance of Jarvis the carrier, that I beg you will write me, 
on the receipt of it, directing to me, undercover, to Mrs. Winifred Jenkins, my aunt's maid, who is a good girl, and has been so kind to me in my affliction, that I have made her my confidant, as for Jarvis. He was very shy of taking charge of my letter and the little parcel, because his sister Sally had liked to have lost her place on my account, indeed I cannot blame the man for his caution, but I have made it worth his while. My dear companion and bedfellow, it is a grievous addition to my other misfortunes, that I am deprived of your agreeable company and conversation, at a time when I need so, much the comfort of your good humor and good sense, but, I hope, the friendship we contracted at boarding school, will last for life I doubt not but on my side it will daily increase and improve, as I gain experience, and learn to know the value of a true friend. Oh, my dear Letty! What shall I say about poor Mr. Wilson? I have promised to break off all correspondence, and, if possible, to forget, him, but, alas! I begin to perceive that will not be in my power as it is by no means proper that the picture should remain in my hands, lest it should be the occasion of more mischief, I have sent it to you by this opportunity, begging you will either keep it safe till better times, or return it to Mr. Wilson himself, who, I suppose, will make it his business to see you at the usual place. If he, should be low-spirited at my sending back his picture, you may tell him I have no occasion for a picture while the original continues engraved on my, but no, I would not have you tell him that neither, because there must be an end of our correspondence, I wish he may forget me, for the sake of his own peace, and yet if he should, he must be a barbarous, but it is impossible, poor Wilson cannot be, false and inconstant, I beseech him not to write to me, nor attempt to see me for some time, for, considering the resentment and passionate temper of my brother Jerry, such an attempt might be attended with consequences which would make us all miserable for life, let us trust to time and the chapter of accidents, or rather to that providence which will not fail, sooner or later, to reward those, that walk in the paths of honor and virtue. I would offer my love to the young ladies, but it is not fit that any of them should know you have received this letter. If we go to Bath, I shall send you my simple remarks upon that famous center of polite amusement, and every other place we may chance to visit, and I flatter myself that my dear Miss Willis will be punctual in answering the letters of, her affectionate, Lydia Melford Clifton, April 6. To Dr. Lewis. Dear Lewis, I have followed your directions with some success, and might have been upon my legs by this time, had the weather permitted me to use my saddle horse. I rode out upon the downs last Tuesday, in the forenoon, when the sky, as far as the visible horizon, was without a cloud, but before I had gone a full mile, I was overtaken instantaneously by a storm of rain that wet me to, the skin in three minutes, whence it came the devil knows, but it has laid me up, I suppose, for one fortnight. It makes me sick to hear people talk of the fine air upon Clifton Downs. How can the air be either agreeable or salutary, where the demon of vapors descends in a perpetual drizzle? My confinement is the more intolerable, as I am surrounded with domestic vexations. My niece has had a dangerous fit of illness, occasioned by that cursed incident at Gloucester, which I mentioned in my last. She is a poor good-natured simpleton, as soft as butter, and as easily melted, not that she's a fool. The girl's parts are not despicable, and her education has not been neglected, that is to say, she can write and spell, and speak French, and play upon the harpsichord, then she dances finely, has a good figure, and is very well inclined, but, she's deficient in spirit, and so susceptible, and so tender for sooth exclamation mark truly, she has got a languishing eye, and reads romances. Then there's her brother, Squire Jerry a pert jack and apes, full of college petulance and self-conceit, proud as a German count, and as hot and hasty as a Welch mountaineer. As for that fantastical animal, my sister Tabby, you are no stranger to her qualifications, I vow to God, she is sometimes so intolerable, that I almost think she's the devil incarnate come to torment me for my sins, 
and yet I am conscious of no sins that ought to entail such famla plagues upon me, why the devil should not I shake off these torments at once? I ain't married to Tabby, thank heaven. Nor did I beget the other two, let them choose, another guardian, for my part one ain't in a condition to take care of myself, much less to superintend the conduct of giddy-headed boys and girls. You earnestly desire to know the particulars of our adventure at Gloucester, which are briefly these, and I hope they will go no further colon Liddy had been so long copped up in a boarding school, which, next to a nunnery, is the worst kind of seminary that, ever was contrived for young women, that she became as inflammable as touch wood, and going to a play in holiday time comma steeth, I'm ashamed to tell you. She fell in love with one of the actors, a handsome young fellow that goes by the name of Wilson. The rascal soon perceived the impression he had made, and managed matters so as to see her at a house where she went to drink tea with her, governess. This was the beginning of a correspondence, which they kept up by means of a jade of a milliner, who made undressed caps for the girls at the boarding school. When we arrived at Gloucester, Liddy came to stay at lodgings with her aunt, and Wilson bribed the maid to deliver a letter into her own hands, but it seems Jerry had already acquired so much credit with the maid, by what means, he best knows, that she carried the letter to him, and so the whole plot was discovered. The rash boy, without saying a word of the matter to me, went immediately in search of Wilson, and, I suppose, treated him with insolence enough. The theatrical hero was too far gone in romance to brook such usage he replied in blank verse, and a formal challenge ensued. They agreed to meet early next morning, and decide the dispute with sword and pistol. I heard nothing at all of the affair, till Mr. Morley came to my bedside in the morning, and told me he was afraid my nephew was going to fight, as he had been overheard talking very loud and vehement with Wilson at the young man's lodgings the night before, and afterwards went and bought powder and ball at a shop in the neighborhood. I got up, immediately, and upon inquiry found he was just going out. I begged Morley to knock up the mayor, that he might interpose as a magistrate, and in the meantime I hobbled after the squire, whom I saw at a distance walking at a great pace towards the city gate, in spite of all my efforts, I could not come up till our two combatants had taken their ground, and were priming their pistols. An old house, luckily screened me from their view so that I rushed upon them at once, before I was perceived. They were both confounded, and attempted to make their escape different ways, but Morley coming up with constables, at that instant, took Wilson into custody, and Jerry followed him quietly to the mayor's house. All this time I was ignorant of what had passed the preceding day, and neither of the parties would discover a tittle of the matter. The mayor observed that it was great presumption in Wilson, who was a stroller, to proceed to such extremities with a gentleman of family and fortune, and threatened to commit him on the vagrant act. The young fellow bustled up with great spirit, declaring he was a gentleman, and would be treated as such, but he refused to explain himself further. The master of the company being sent for, and examined, touching the said Wilson, said the young man had engaged with him at Birmingham about six months ago, but never would take his salary that he had behaved so well in his private character, as to acquire the respect and goodwill of all his acquaintance, and that the public owned his merit as an actor was altogether extraordinary. After all, I, fancy, he will turn out to be a runaway prentice from London. The manager offered to bail him for any sum, provided he would give his word and honour that he would keep the peace, but the young gentleman was on his high ropes, and would by no means lay himself under any restrictions. On the other hand, Hopeful was equally obstinate, till at length the mayor declared, that if they both refused to, be bound over, he would immediately commit Wilson as a vagrant to hard labor. I own I was much pleased with Jerry's behavior on this occasion, he said, that rather than Mr. Wilson should be treated in such an ignominious manner, he would give his word and honor to prosecute the affair no further while they remained at Gloucester. Wilson thanked him for his generous manner of proceeding, and was, discharged. On our return to our lodgings, my nephew explained the whole mystery, and I own I was exceedingly incensed, Liddy being questioned on the subject, 
and very severely reproached by that wildcat my sister Tabby, first swooned away, then dissolving in a flood of tears, confessed all the particulars of the correspondence, at the same time giving up three letters, which was all she had, received from her admirer. The last, which Jerry intercepted, I send you enclosed, and when you have read it, I dare say you won't wonder at the progress the writer had made in the heart of a simple girl, utterly unacquainted with the characters of mankind. Thinking it was high time to remove her from such a dangerous connection, I carried her off the very next day to Bristol, but the poor creature, was so frightened and fluttered, by our threats and expostulations, that she fell sick the fourth day after our arrival at Clifton, and continued so ill for a whole week, that her life was despaired of. It was not till yesterday that Dr. Rigg declared her out of danger. You cannot imagine what I have suffered, partly from the indiscretion of this poor child, but much more from the fear of losing, her entirely. This air is intolerably cold, and the place quite solitary, I never go down to the well without returning low-spirited, for there I meet with half a dozen poor emaciated creatures, with ghostly looks, in the last stage of a consumption who have made shift to linger through the winter like so many exotic plants languishing in a hothouse, but in all appearance, will drop into their, graves before the sun has warmth enough to mitigate the rigor of this ungenial spring. If you think the bath water will be of any service to me, I will go thither so soon as my niece can bear the motion of the coach. Tell Barnes I am obliged to him for his advice, but don't choose to follow it. If Davis voluntarily offers to give up the farm, the other shall have it, but I will not begin at this time of day to distress my tenants, because they are unfortunate, and cannot make regular payments, I wonder that Barnes should think me capable of such oppression, as for Higgins, the fellow is a notorious poacher, to be sure, and an impudent rascal to set his snares in my own paddock, but, I suppose, he thought he had some right especially in my absence, to partake of what nature seems to have, intended for common use, you may threaten him in my name, as much as you please, and if he repeats the offence, let me know it before you have recourse to justice. I know you are a great sportsman, and oblige many of your friends, I need not tell you to make use of my grounds, but it may be necessary to hint, that I am more afraid of my fowling piece than of my game. When you can spare two or three, brace of partridges, send them over by the stagecoach, and tell Gwai Lim that she forgot to pack up my flannel and wide shoes in the trunk mail, I shall trouble you as usual, from time to time, till at last I suppose you will be tired of corresponding with your assured friend, M. Bramble Clifton, A. To Miss Lydia Melford Miss Willis has pronounced my doom, you are going away, dear Miss Melford exclamation mark you are going to be removed, I know not whither. What shall I do? Which way shall I turn for consolation? I know not what I say, all night long have I been tossed in a sea of doubts and fears, uncertainty and distraction, without being able to connect my thoughts, much less to form any consistent plan, of conduct. I was even tempted to wish that I had never seen you, or that you had been less amiable, or less compassionate to your poor Wilson, and yet it would be detestable ingratitude in me to form such a wish, considering how much I am indebted to your goodness, and the ineffable pleasure I have derived from your indulgence and approbation, good God! I never heard your name mentioned without, emotion. The most distant prospect of being admitted to your company filled my whole soul with a kind of pleasing alarm. As the time approached, my heart beat with redoubled force, and every nerve thrilled with a transport of expectation, but, when I found myself actually in your presence semicolon when I heard you speak semicolon when I saw you smile, when I beheld your charming eyes turned favorably upon me, my, breast was filled with such tumults of delight, as wholly deprived me of the power of utterance and wrapped me in a delirium of joy, encouraged by your sweetness of temper and affability, I ventured to describe the feelings of my heart, even then you did not check my presumption, you pitied my sufferings and gave me leave to hope you put a favorable perhaps too favorable a construction, on my, 
appearance certain it is, I am no player in love, I speak the language of my own heart, and have no prompter but nature. Yet there is something in this heart, which I have not yet disclosed. I flattered myself, but, I will not, I must not proceed. Dear Miss Liddy. For heaven's sake, contrive, if possible, some means of letting me speak to you before you leave Gloucester, otherwise, I know not what, will, but I begin to rave again. I will endeavor to bear this trial with fortitude, while I am capable of reflecting upon your tenderness and truth, I surely have no cause to despair, a cloud hangs over me, and there is a dreadful weight upon my spirits. While you stay in this place, I shall continually hover about your lodgings, as the parted soul is said to linger about the grave where its mortal, comfort lies. I know, if it is in your power, you will task your humanity, your compassion, shall I add, your affection question mark in order to assuage the almost intolerable disquiet that torments the heart of your afflicted, Wilson Gloucester, March 31. To Sir Watkin Phillips, of Jesus College, Oxon. Hot Well, April 18. Dear Phillips, I give Mansell credit for his invention, in propagating the report that I had a quarrel with a Mountebank's Mary Andrew at Gloucester, but I have too much respect for every appendage of wit, to quarrel even with the lowest buffoonery, and therefore I hope Mansell and I shall always be good friends. I cannot, however, approve of his drowning my poor dog Ponto, on purpose to convert Ivid's plea in Nasmin to a punning epitaph comedy and quoclit a Ponto, for, that he threw him into the Isis, when it was so high and impetuous, with no other view than to kill the fleas, is an excuse that will not hold water, but I leave poor Ponto to his fate, and hope Providence will take care to accommodate Mansell with a drier, death. As there is nothing that can be called company at the well, I am here in a state of absolute rustication, this, however, gives me leisure to observe the singularities in my uncle's character, which seems to have interested your curiosity. The truth is, his disposition and mine, which, like oil and vinegar, repelled one another at first, have now begun to mix by dint of being beat up, together. I was once apt to believe him a complete cynic, and that nothing but the necessity of his occasions could compel him to get within the pale of society, I am now of another opinion. I think his peevishness arises partly from bodily pain, and partly from a natural excess of mental sensibility, for, I suppose, the mind as well as the body, is in some cases endued with a morbid excess of, sensation. I was t'other day much diverted with a conversation that passed in the pump room, betwixt him and the famous Dr. Ellen, who is come to ply at the well for patients. My uncle was complaining of the sting, occasioned by the vast quantity of mud and slime which the river leaves at low ebb under the windows of the pump room. He observed, that the exhalations arising from such a nuisance, could, not but be prejudicial to the weak lungs of many consumptive patients, who came to drink the water. The doctor overhearing this remark, made up to him and assured him he was mistaken. He said, people in general were so misled by vulgar prejudices that philosophy was hardly sufficient to undeceive them. Then humming thrice, he assumed a most ridiculous solemnity of aspect, and entered into a, learned investigation of the nature of stink. He observed, that stink, or stench, meant no more than a strong impression on the olfactory nerves and might be applied to substances of the most opposite qualities, that in the Dutch language, stinken signifies the most agreeable perfume, as well as the most fetid odor, as appears in Van Vlaudel's translation of Horace, in that beautiful ode, Quis, Multigracilis, and C. The words Fiquitis profusia so dribus, he translates Van Civet and Moss Cottage as stinken, that individuals differed toto coelo in their opinion of smells, which, indeed, was altogether as arbitrary as the opinion of beauty, that the French were pleased with the putrid effluvia of animal food, and so were the Hottentots in Africa, and the savages in Greenland, and that the Negroes on, the coast of Senegal would not touch fish till it was rotten, strong presumptions in favor of what is generally called stink, as those nations are in a state of nature, undebauched by luxury, 
unseduced by whim and caprice, that he had reason to believe the stercoraceous flavor, condemned by prejudice as a stink, was, in fact, most agreeable to the organs of smelling, for, that every person who, pretended to nauseate the smell of another's excretions, snuffed up his own with particular complacency, for the truth of which he appealed to all the ladies and gentlemen then present, he said, the inhabitants of Madrid and Edinburgh found particular satisfaction in breathing their own atmosphere, which was always impregnated with stercoraceous effluvia, that the learned Dr. B., in his treatise on, the four digestions, explains in what manner the volatile effluvia from the intestines stimulate and promote the operations of the animal economy, he affirmed, the last Grand Duke of Tuscany, of the Medici's family, who refined upon sensuality with the spirit of a philosopher, was so delighted with that odor, that he caused the essence of order to be extracted, and used it as the most delicious perfume, that he himself, the doctor, when he happened to be low-spirited, or fatigued with business, found immediate relief and uncommon satisfaction from hanging over the stale contents of a close stool, while his servant stirred it about under his nose, nor was this effect to be wondered at, when we consider that this substance abounds with the self-same volatile salts that are so greedily, smelled to by the most delicate invalids after they have been extracted and sublimed by the chemists. By this time the company began to hold their noses, but the doctor, without taking the least notice of this signal, proceeded to show, that many fetid substances were not only agreeable but salutary, such as isophetida, and other medicinal gums, resins, roots, and vegetables, over and above, burnt feathers, tan pits, candle snuffs, and sea. In short, he used many learned arguments to persuade his audience out of their senses, and from stench made a transition to filth, which he affirmed was also a mistaken idea, inasmuch as objects so called, were no other than certain modifications of matter, consisting of the same principles that enter into the composition of all created essences, whatever they may be, that in the filthiest production of nature, a philosopher considered nothing but the earth, water, salt and air, of which it was compounded, that, for his own part, he had no more objections to drinking the dirtiest ditch water, than he had to a glass of water from the hot well, provided he was assured there was nothing poisonous in the concrete. Then addressing himself to my, uncle, sir, said he, you seem to be of a dropsical habit, and probably will soon have a confirmed ascites, if I should be present when you are tapped. I will give you a convincing proof of what I assert, by drinking without hesitation the water that comes out of your abdomen. The ladies made wry faces at this declaration, and my uncle, changing color, told him he did not desire any such proof, of his philosophy, but I should be glad to know, said he, what makes you think I am of a dropsical habit? Sir, I beg pardon, replied the doctor, I perceive your ankles are swelled and you seem to have the facies luca phlegmatica. Perhaps, indeed, your disorder may be edematous, or gouty, or it may be the lus veneri, if you have any reason to flatter yourself it is this last, sir, I will, undertake to cure you with three small pills, even if the disease should have attained its utmost inveteracy. Sir, it is an arcanum, which I have discovered, and prepared with infinite labor. Sir. I have lately cured a woman in Bristol, a common prostitute, sir, who had got all the worst symptoms of the disorder, such as nodi, toffee, and gummata, veruca, cristugali, and a serpiginous eruption, or rather a pocky itch all over her body. By the time she had taken the second pill, sir, by heaven, she was as smooth as my hand, and the third made her sound and as fresh as a newborn infant. Sir, cried my uncle peevishly, I have no reason to flatter myself that my disorder comes within the efficacy of your nostrum. But this patient you talk of may not be so sound at bottom as you, imagine. I can't possibly be mistaken, rejoined the philosopher, for I have had communication with her three times, I always ascertain my cures in that manner. At this remark, all the ladies retired to another corner of the room and some of them began to spit dot as to my uncle, though he was ruffled at first by the doctor saying he was dropsical, 
he could not help smiling at this ridiculous, confession and, I suppose, with a view to punish this original, told him there was a wart upon his nose, that looked a little suspicious. I don't pretend to be a judge of those matters, said he, but I understand that warts are often produced by the distemper, and that one upon your nose seems to have taken possession of the very keystone of the bridge, which I hope is in no danger of falling, L, N seemed a little confounded at this remark, and assured him it was nothing but a common excrescence of the cuticula, but that the bones were all sound below, for the truth of this assertion he appealed to the touch desiring he would feel the part. My uncle said it was a matter of such delicacy to meddle with a gentleman's nose, that he declined the office, upon which, the doctor turning to me, entreated me to do him that favor. I complied with his request, and handled it so roughly, that he sneezed, and the tears ran down his cheeks, to the no small entertainment of the company, and particularly of my uncle who burst out a-laughing for the first time since I have been with him, and took notice, that the part seemed to be very tender. Sir, cried the doctor, it is naturally a tender, part, but to remove all possibility of doubt, I will take off the wart this very night. So saying, he bowed, with great solemnity all round, and retired to his own lodgings, where he applied a caustic to the wart but it spread in such a manner as to produce a considerable inflammation, attended with an enormous swelling, so that when he next appeared, his whole face was overshadowed by this, tremendous nozzle, and the rueful eagerness with which he explained this unlucky accident, was ludicrous beyond all description. I was much pleased with meeting the original of a character, which you and I have often laughed at in description, and what surprises me very much, I find the features in the picture, which has been drawn for him, rather softened than overcharged, as I have something else to say, and this letter has run to an unconscionable length, I shall now give you a little respite, and trouble you again by the very first post. I wish you would take it in your head to retaliate these double strokes upon yours always, J.